Today on the We Invested podcast, we have John Sarasani, and he is the founder and CEO of Glencrest Global. John, how are you doing today? Happy to be here, Wesley. Thanks for inviting me on, my friend. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for joining. I was letting you know uh, before we started recording that I was looking at your Instagram and telling you that, you know, I'm a fan and I'm a supporter and that you're doing some some amazing things out here in the world. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I uh, I appreciate that immensely. I started doing just kind of some reels as well as some TikToks, just short little business lessons and, and life lessons, things I've picked up, some gems I've picked up along the way. And uh, really recently I started a podcast and that was really just a demand for my Instagram following, like saying, hey, quick, quick cut of the shit at 60 seconds. Let's d- dive a little deeper. So out here trying to be like you and shit with the podcast, man. Exactly, exactly. And how are you liking that transition so far? Just starting a, a new thing and, and uh, trying a new field out. It's a lot of fun, man. It's a lot of fun. I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know how often you do your show, but but I'll, I'll tell you what, the, the difference with me... I, the, the reels and the TikToks, I just produce that shit as we go. Something comes into mind, grab my guy, hey, videotape this, let's add it, let's go. Whereas the podcast, um, you know, it's more reliant on guests. And I'm trying to get some, some um, you know, kind of high profile people on there. So it's, I'm limited, limiting it to just one a week right now, but I already got seven filmed. And uh, you know what I mean? I, I'm just like sitting on it. So it's, you know, anyway, it's, it's so far so good, man. I'll tell you that much. That's incredible, man. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, before we get started, would you mind just letting the people know how they can find you on social media and the internet? Sure. It's John Sarasani, J-O-H-N-C-E-R-A-S-A-N-I. And that is just at John Sarasani on Instagram as, as well as TikTok and LinkedIn as well, if you want to hit me up there. Awesome, man. So, you know, let's just start from the beginning and talk a little bit about, you know, where you're from and where you grew up. Sure, man. I grew up in the stuff, actually YouTube too. I'm getting big on my YouTube, John Sarasani on, on YouTube and 2000% Raise is the name of the uh, podcast and YouTube channel. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, uh, Schomburg, North Suburb, um, you know, played sports in co- in uh, high school, eventually ended up playing, playing in college. Uh, Midwest guy, man, Midwest guy. And you know, I, uh, that's what, that's where my heart is, Chicago. I, I spent half of my time out in Los Angeles now as well with the second home there, but, um, I still act like a Chicago guy when I'm in LA or I try to at least. No, that's incredible, man. And I've personally never been to Chicago, but I hear that they have some of the best food in the country up there. Well, Hey man, we, we will take that Chicagoans right now. Oh, what, you know what Chicago is known for? We, we will take food because we're known lately in the news for a lot of, uh, of other things that aren't that aren't so pleasant it, it seems like whenever i tra- travel nationally or even internationally unfortunately um you know people think think uh of chicago with a certain connotation and i'm here to tell all your listeners it is safe to come here don't uh <laughs> don't believe the hype okay and uh the thing that is true about chicago is our people are awesome and uh yes this is where michael jordan became the goat <laughs> all right exactly exactly yeah. So, you know, how would you say that growing up in Chicago um, impacted your outlook on life and success? You know, it's it's interesting, man. Um, you know, Chicago is, is a very heavy sports town. You know what I mean? You, you're, you're not going to, like, everyone's, you know, either a Cubs fan. There's some White Sox fans, too. I grew up in the 90s. When I, I was in high school in the 90s, everybody, and I mean, everybody was a Chicago Bulls fan. Um, you, you could not be. You could not be. Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Horace Grant, all, all of them. Everybody was a Chicago Bulls fan. Everybody. Um, it's kind of like probably how people in Boston right now have been Patriots fans for the last 20 years. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a sports town, man. It's a sports town. I, I think you know, comparing that versus other cities, when, I, when I've traveled to places like like Miami, for instance. Okay, yeah, the Dolphins got some fans, man, but they, no one gives a shit. It ain't like it ain't like Chicago, you know what I mean? Or even Los Angeles. The the Rams just won the Super Bowl. You think the Rams are the hottest thing in LA right now? Well, maybe, but there's a lot of other shit going on, so so it doesn't feel like how it is. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I would think I would think that's kind of a a difference maker, and you know, it's it's a big city that um you know still has midwest values you know and and i feel that whenever i'm out 
on the East Coast. You know, you, a Chicago person goes and does business with a New York person or even a Boston person, you kind of scratch your head a little bit. I'm like, this guy's kind of an ass, asshole. You know, Chicago people are just a little, we're more Indiana and Kansas versus New York City, but we're a lot more New York City than the Indiana and Kansas people. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? If that makes sense. Um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of where I'm from, bro. No, that's incredible, man. And yeah. I've, I've heard a lot about that, like Midwest hospitality. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had a couple friends out from Iowa, and they were some of the nicest people that I've ever met. So I okay. know that people in the Midwest are super cool and just super friendly and inviting. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, what I want to ask you is, I know that you played some D1 football. Oh, yeah. uh, you mentioned that you grew up as a sports guy and love sports and play sports. So, mm -hmm. you know, what I want to ask is, what were some of the lessons that were instilled in you or that you learned while playing this sport at such a high level? Yeah, man. So I played at University of Notre Dame. I played tight end there. Um, started at tight end there. Had a little bit of adversity that I overcame and ended up transferring after my sophomore year to Northwestern University, which at the time was a very strong football program in the 90s. And anybody that follows Big Ten football would be familiar with what I'm talking about there. And, um, you know, really played for two great programs. I, I think um, I think lessons that, that you pick up in football that, that really translate to the work world are, are really obvious, man. And, and you wouldn't think they would be like, I, I guess when I was doing it at the time, I didn't even realize it. I'm like, all right, dude, well, everyone works their ass off. Everybody like is motivated. Everybody wants to show well at their job. And you, you, you get to corporate America and you find out pretty quickly that just is not the case, man. That That's just not the case. You got, you got people trying to figure out how little they could do and keep their job. You know what I mean? Versus right. people trying to, you know, rise, rise up and, and um, you know, uh, climb that, that, that promotional ladder and, you know, whatever that might, might look like. So I think that competitive nature in me, um, really came into play R rather quickly. I, I noticed it almost immediately. And what, what's funny for me, Wes, is that <laughs> I almost became too competitive at, at it. I, I probably did in retrospect because it almost wasn't enough for me at that point. Okay, corporate America ain't doing the trick for me, bro. I need to leave corporate America and go be an entrepreneur and do this shit on my own. I'm very thankful to corporate America for everything that I just learned there. I consider that, I call it my paid training. It wasn't a, it wasn't like a paid training. Like that was what they're hiring me for. That was a real job. But for me, it was paid training. I learned there while they were paying me a salary, how to go into business for myself and, and, and really control my own destiny. So I, I think, uh, I think my background in athletics, you know, kind of gave me that edge. So, you know, what was that transition like? from working for working for someone to starting mm -hmm. your own business yeah it's a big deal man it's a big deal because what happens is you especially if you're in a sales type of environment and if you're like me hey man it's about the competition and you know i'm on a sales force working for someone else and we're, we're all competitive you're competing against the other sales reps you're competing against the other reps at other offices you know, you're trying to you know, qualify for that company trip. You're looking for, okay, on the Monday morning sales sales meeting, who who led the week in sales? All that shit goes away, bro. You're on your own. You're working from your kitchen table. The only thing that you see, the, the only, the only, you know, clapping that's going to happen for you is watching your checking checkbook balance go up. And, and um, ultimately <laughs> that's better. Right. <laughs> but, but, but it takes some getting used to it. It's really a paradigm shift. So, um, you know, what would you say were, I guess, so you mentioned that it was difficult, I guess, losing that competitive edge. Yeah. What were some things that you enjoyed about being able to work for yourself and to do your own thing? The sky's the limit, man. So, so, you know, my brain doesn't turn off. And what I found when I was working or somebody else was that you kind of cap out at some point in terms of you know how much you could put into that job if my brain's still working and i have an important meeting tomorrow and it's 9 p.m at night i could only double check and triple check that presentation that i'm doing so many freaking times man i i could only 
you know, go on everyone's LinkedIn and memorize all the buyers, you know, backgrounds and think about little gems to bring up. Like there's only so much I could do as a salesperson working for someone one else that, that I, I you over research a situation like that almost comes across creepy to the prospective <laughs> client. Cause they're like, uh, how the hell do you know my kid's name? I just met you. Um, but when you work for yourself, there's no capping out. There's always something, man. You got that entrepreneurial spirit in you. Boom. Here we go, man. What, what's next? Oh, shit. Okay. Well, that presentation that I'm doing tomorrow. Okay. Got that covered. Oh, let me put together a flow chart in, on how I'm going to hire and who I'm going to hire over the next three years. You know what? I, I've been putting all my jobs through Monster. Let me let me email the rep from Indeed that's been calling me and see what their value proposition is. There, there's always something that you could do. And some of it, some of it might be, seem a little bit tedious, but that's what I signed up for. I don't mind doing that tedious shit when I know it's all going towards building, hopefully, an empire. Yeah, man, and it's it's crazy because I was just talking to my buddy about this today a few hours ago is that, you know, even if your business is thriving this, and it's yeah. successful, there's always ways to improve it and make it run more efficiently. Um, so doubt. there's always things to work out, to work on and complete and improve upon. Yeah, um, and you don't know what you're going to stumble across, man. I, I remember right now it seems probably so freaking basic, but you know, Dropbox. Okay. People that use Dropbox, there's a thing called Dropbox for business where it's secured and it works the same way as personal Dropbox. I'm sure most of your listeners don't understand what Dropbox is. Okay. This was not common knowledge 10, 12 years ago. Okay. I remember like I was going to spend like 18 grand to build a network for my one office for 12 employees so we could share files. It didn't like matter and i had an it guy out give me this quote and they're building this infrastructure and i have this big freaking machine i'm like dude can't this be in the freaking cloud so that that's a great example of just researching and having shit to do all the damn time mm -hmm. i'm in a focus group of other business people i say guys this this makes sense to you i'm spending 18 grand on this thing someone like, hey have you checked out dropbox oh shit you just saved me 18 grand because I spent, you know, at 9.58 p.m., nine minutes before I'm going to bed or two, I don't go to bed at 10.07, sorry, two minutes before I'm going to bed. You know what I mean? Somebody, somebody freaking, you know, just saved me $18,000 and I got Dropbox for business, which is the whole freaking future in the cloud anyway. But at that time, you know, I got IT people telling me I'm freaking crazy. You know what I mean? And really, they're just trying to, you know, effing secure their own jobs and livelihoods because Google and Dropbox and everyone else is about to take, take over their entire infrastructure for, for small companies like mine. I'm sure the big companies still need all that shit, but us small guys, man, we didn't need any of that shit that I was about to buy. But anyway, I digressed a little bit, but that, that it really is a great example though of the kind of shit that's always going to be popping up as a business owner. There's always, always something, bro. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Man, so, you know, let's just kind of push forward a little bit, man, move yeah. forward in time and talk about, you know, your current company that you created and that you're building yeah. right now, which you is got it. Glencrest Global. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so I want to ask, what is Glencrest Global? Yeah, it's a venture capital firm. It's a venture capital firm. So I built a company. I worked in insurance, like I told you, and I and I and then I went out. I, I, the company I was referring to earlier as a salesperson was in insurance. I decided, you know what? F this noise, I could do my own insurance company and I could do it better than they're doing it. Now I worked for a billion dollar company. That was quite a, oh, wait, wait a minute. Um, but I had a niche idea. I knew it would work. I was 27 years old, quit my job, did it from my kitchen table. All right. Obviously it grew. I only hired people when I needed people as we grew. I ended up selling it for tens of millions um, to a private equity firm nine and a half years later. Okay. Now all of a sudden I'm 37 years old, dude. I don't got to work again the rest of my life. I was contractually obligated to um, do something as part of that transaction with the firm that bought mine. Um, so I had to stick around for, for five years. That was finished up. Now I'm really retired. I was trying to retire those last five years. Now I'm really retired and I'm 42 years old. 
I got all this capital. Like I said, I grew up in Schaumburg, Illinois, very middle class. My dad was a teacher. Um, you know what I mean? It's not like, you know, we come from some wealthy background. I'm sitting on this pile of money and I just decide, you know what, man, I can't just sit here and be retired. And I, uh, I decided that I'm going to go work with entrepreneurs and uh, founders that uh, need capital. And I'm going to really formalize some shit I was already doing as an angel investor and um, refer to myself as an early stage venture capitalist instead. And I look for opportunities where I infuse money into these organizations, but, but they're also people that could use my guidance or use my advisement. Sometimes they got all their shit together and really they just want to tap into my network. Whatever the case may be, I look for opportunities where I could bring more than just capital to the table. Because the way it works, Wes, it, it, when, when companies are growing, it, it, if it works out as, as anticipated, they're going to keep growing round after round. They're going to keep raising money. And I'm just using my own capital for this. And yeah, I got a lot of money as a person, but later rounds, it's going to be led by like funds and private equity firms and, you know, pools of freaking money. And I'm not putting $80 million into a round of some company one day. It's my own money. I, you know, it's not going to happen. Right. Um, um, so, so what happens is if you come in in these early rounds and say you put a half a million dollars into a company, you mean everything to them right now. You're awesome. They need you. But if that's all you brought to the table, by the time they get to that second, third or fourth funding round later, that half a million dollars ain't shit. Now I'm happy because if they're four rounds in now, that means something's going right. They haven't gone out of business. This is going the right damn direction. But I don't really have a seat at the table anymore. I'm just along for the damn ride. If I could come in with a value proposition beyond just the money, you know, I'll always be relevant in, the, in those conversations. Hey, let's ask John what he thinks about his, you know, hey, did this happen in the insurance world? There's a supplementary product we're putting together. Could you we bounce this off you or whatever? So, I mean, that's that's kind of why I look at it that way. Understood. You know, and mm -hmm. I think you said something really important. Uh, you mentioned that you grew up in like a, a middle class home. Your father mm -hmm. was a teacher. So, yep. you know, what I want to ask is, how did you prepare yourself for that windfall of money that you received from the sale of the company? You know, yeah, not coming from a wealthy background. How do you prepare to receive millions of dollars from that sale? Like what, what what's going through your mind at that time? Yeah, well, so I kind of inched into it. So, so what, what happened was, yeah, I had that huge windfall where game over, don't have to work anymore when, when I sold it. But the reason that they were, the reason that it was bought by so much and for so much and the reason private equity even, you know, was attracted to it in the first place is because it was already making so much money. Mm -hmm. I had never brought in any investors. I owned a hundred percent of this company. So I was making upward to $3 million a year for a while, you know, it didn't just happen. I didn't go from zero to 3 million, but you know, you, you, you get kind of like, oh, now you're making 150. Oh shit. Now you're making 400. And it was after that year I made 400 that I started going kind of hockey sticking. Then the next year I made 900 and then 1.4. And then it just kind of kept going up at, at that kind of pace. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's kind of hilarious though. Because once you sell it, yeah, you got all this pile of money they give to you for it, but you don't have any money coming in anymore. And I'm so used to like having all this money coming in, having my household expenses be nowhere close to that each month. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, wait a minute, I got, I got to pull, I got to pull from this money to pay my shit. I, I'm actually pulling away from it instead of adding to it. Um, so, so to answer your question, that was kind of a weird little. I don't know, a little a mindset change. Um, yeah. No, understandable, man. I mean, um, it's, it's never as easy as it sounds. You know, it's never as easy as it sounds just getting this right. getting this windfall, even though you work hard for it, even though you prepare mm -hmm. for it. Right. I'm sure your mindset was probably focused on how do I build the best company? How do I create the best processes? How do I mm -hmm. bring the best people on my team? Yeah. Um, you know, and I... And, from that standpoint, from that angle, from what you built yourself, I know that gives you the 
perfect leverage to now look for um new businesses to invest in and to yeah. to fund and to provide capital for so yeah. you know what would you say are some of the things that you look for when you're looking to invest in new companies and, and invest in new founders yeah well the first thing i look for is is the company even an investable company is it even a company that really makes sense to, to bring on investors you know especially out on the west coast it, it's you get people that start running in these entrepreneurial types of circles whether they're you know discords or chat rooms or you know whatever the hell they're doing and everyone thinks they need to raise money sometimes i have to stop and i'll like look at the presentation i'll be like dude just just don't just keep doing what you're doing you're gonna make enough money reinvest the money that you're making and grow at that pace you don't need an extra three million dollars right now and have all of us damn investors breathing down your freaking neck. Why, why are you signing up for this headache? Just keep going at that pace, at, at the pace you're already doing. You're doing just fine. Um, you know, so, so if I see that, it'll be a red flag um, because, A, why didn't the founder recognize that himself? Okay. Um, B... Yeah, there's no way he didn't recognize that himself. This guy's full of shit. There's <laughs> there's something happening here that he ain't telling me. Because why would you give up 12% of your company right now to do this? You know, it looks like you're making 800 grand right now here, buddy. And your background before this was a was a math teacher. And now you're making 800 grand allegedly. Okay, this is starting to seem like some kind of Ponzi scheme or something. Because for some reason, you think you need to raise $3 million. Um, you know, obviously that was an extreme example, but you, you'd be, you'd be amazed. You, you'd be amazed that some people, I swear to God, just want to raise money to be relevant seemingly. They just want to like hang out with rich people and talk about their business. And then all of a sudden, if somebody says, okay, yeah, I'll invest. They're like, oh shit, what do we do now? Like, you, you, you got to be careful what you wish for, man. You bring in an investor, that's that's the whole game changes. And I'm sure you watch or your audience watches um, freaking Shark Tank and some of the best damn businesses on there. They tell, I'm not investing because you don't need a freaking investor. Why, why the hell would you want this headache of having to deal with us, man? This is not a business that needs an investor. So, you know, there's, there's some insight for you. And that, that happens a lot um, on the early stage uh, venture capital stuff. So, I mean, you know, it's clear that you have the experience of building a successful business and building a profitable business. But yeah. is there anything that you did to, um, you know, prepare yourself before you started your business, either reading books, listening to podcasts, networking? What did you do to build up your business IQ and your business acumen? You know, I'll tell you what, I, I guess I didn't really, for me, when I started my business, it was all about the industry that I was in, okay, mastering that industry and learning the ins and outs of it, knowing everything I needed to know. I, I worked for an insurance, a huge insurance brokerage firm, and yeah, I was sales, but sales is the hardest part. The easy part was the servicing of the account after the point of sale. Well, why... Wouldn't I, if I know I could sell and bring in business, well, why don't I just do it for myself? Like, like everybody, the customer service rep and the account manager, they have the easy job. I have the hard job. Well, why don't I learn their job too? make sure that I can retain business when I go out on my own, go sell it, then retain it. And I didn't know what the hell they're doing in order to do that. And, and maybe I'm not going to do all A through Z, but for long term, but I better know it because I'm going to need to hire people and understand what they're doing for, for them to do it. So, so I became a really heavy student of, of that, um, knowing specifically to my job. But I'll tell you this, Wes, um, books that influenced me, um, probably the, mo the biggest one would be uh, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, have you read it by any chance? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go, man. I, I would say that book for anybody that is in sales or any really kind of customer service environment, really anything, anything at all, unless you're, you know, 
sell it on Amazon and it's you don't have to deal with people directly or something like that. But but if you have to deal with people, um, that book I've been referring to it on and off for twenty years. Um, you know, and it's funny. I, you know why I bought the thing in the first place? Because I saw it at a damn bookstore when I got divorced. I'm like, you know, I need to kind of like self help book. I'm kind of depressed. And then I just saw it in the damn self help help section. Wasn't even getting it for business reasons. And it applies really to, to your whole life everywhere, man. Um, that book, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That book is so ingrained in my head. The lessons from that book are so ingrained in my head that I don't even know if I learned them from the book or if I already knew them. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Kiyosaki. So people say, oh, like Kiyosaki said, it's the rat race in corporate America. I go, wait, Kiyosaki said that? No, I said that. Well, wait a minute. Did I, did I get it from Kiyosaki? I, I don't know. But um, anyway, those, those are two that I would definitely, definitely uh, recommend to your audience. For sure, man. So, I mean, and those are definitely some great recommendations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but as a venture capitalist, yeah, how important is it to network and build meaningful relationships? Extremely, man. Extremely. So what happens in the VC world is that you, 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 you have, it's almost like two sides, but everybody's commingled. You have these guys over here with all the money, these guys over here that are entrepreneurs that need the money. You got these people in the middle of them that just want to be relevant, introducing, you know, I can't tell you how many people I got that are to contact me. Is it your company? Wait, no, no, I'm working for them. Just people out there hustling trying to surround themselves with people with money so then they could go turn to their entrepreneur or founder friends and introduce them there. Um, you know, there's people that try to make livings doing that. I, I personally don't take those people. I don't listen to them because to me, they're like a realtor um, and not that realtors are bad, but realtors are only getting paid if this deal gets done. Okay. So, so a person in the middle trying to introduce me to ABC company over here and tell me what a great deal it is. Okay. Well, he's probably getting some kind of cut. If I give a hundred grand, he's probably getting 2% of it or some whatever. I don't like working in that environment and I don't need those people in the middle anyways, quite frankly, we'll, we'll find each other, man. I mean, there's something called LinkedIn right now. You know, people use LinkedIn. I mean, there, there, there's no shortage of deal flow. One of the things you'll talk, you'll hear, you'll hear venture capitalists talk about or, or hear people approach them with is, hey, do you need some help with your deal flow? Let's, let's compare deal flow. Dude, it's great, but I got, you want to see my inbox? I got enough freaking deal flow. Okay. Now, one of my freaking billionaire friends that has, that gets across his desk and, you know, it's like the next Uber or something. And you need a couple million to get in this. And they're only talking to their like rich friends that they think could maybe be strategic help, strategically helpful as well. Yeah, that's the phone call I want. But everybody else running around and the same guy bulk messaging people off of LinkedIn, you know, I, I got enough of that. And um, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate for those early stage guys that actually have a great idea because like... You get inundated, man. You put your name out there as a bunch of campus. Everyone's like, I, I don't read half the emails and it's, it kind of sucks, but because I'm sure there's ones in there that, you know, deserve to be read. Um, but, you know, there's just so many, so many people out there trying to raise money. It's, it's um, amazing. Man, is it stressful having to deal with those kind of pressures? Uh, just having people coming at you from every angle, uh, you know, with, with the, with the specific motive? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 uh, I try to, I try to, I try to, um, comb things out relatively quickly. Um, you know, I started going out, out to Los Angeles a lot over the last few years and I almost was too paranoid sometimes. Well, dude, I'm, why is this guy being nice to me? He wants money for this. And this way he wants money for that. Or he knows somebody. I started getting like paranoid because those people did exist, but it wasn't everybody. And, and it really wasn't most people either. But I got so paranoid with just why the hell is this guy? Why does my neighbor want to be my friend? He must know somebody raising money. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, it, you know, it, it's just like you know, as is life, man. You know, you know, people want to be your friends for different reasons, and 
you got to just kind of see through that shit. You have a, a great presence on social media, man. We were talking about it earlier from, you know, Instagram to TikTok yeah. to YouTube. So, I mean, how is having that presence on social media benefited you? And I guess, when did you realize like, oh man, this is, this is something that I need to be doing. This is a tool that I need to use. Yeah, I, I think once I got serious uh, uh, about being a venture capitalist, that that did matter a lot, um, especially in LA, man. Like people treat Instagram out there like it's their freaking business card. It's kind of crazy, man. It's like Chicago, that shit don't happen. I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you, man. But like, you know, yeah, in Chicago, you know what? People will check somebody out, they'll, they'll Google them and maybe they look at their Instagram, but boom, LA, skip Google, skip this. <laughs> We're going right to Instagram. And, and, and maybe that's a good thing too, because you can see how people present themselves. Um, but uh, I, I kind of figured that out pretty quickly from going out to Los Angeles. Uh, that's how that world works. And um, started focusing on it a little bit more. Uh, put myself in, in, in a few different circles that I thought, I thought mattered and um really just started putting out content and my um you know my following grew re really you know over uh, not not rapidly and you know but i'm at like i think twenty seven thousand followers roughly right now and uh you know that was uh that was slow and steady slow and slow and steady you know what i mean um got good engagement from people and what's cool about it is you know all through high school with people that my kids, friends, parents are like that on there too. But I'll also have like, you know, some guy that owns 10 manufacturing firms that's looking to expand to, to 15 and needs a business loan contact. And I'll have people contacting me about their podcast that they want to be on that has young entrepreneurs looking for advice on venture capitalism. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's, uh, it's cool. I'm glad I'm doing it. Um, the the reach is just uh you know it, it serves so many different purposes and you know it's funny everything i just said right there i'm kind of just talking out loud here but or thinking out loud here i'm starting to feel like tick tick tock i could i could be more you know everyone i just mentioned that's following me on instagram isn't following me on tiktok tiktok's almost only business people are only following me for that reason it's a little bit more it's a little easier to target you know what i mean like freaking instagram i feel like well, every month or so, I better post a picture of my son or something like that, or my dogs, because <laughs> TikTok doesn't even cross my damn mind. You know what I mean? Nah, man, it's insane, like, how much these social media platforms are exploding, mm -hmm. you know, especially TikTok. But it's yep. like, you know, Instagram is like, like you were mentioning, man, out here on the West Coast, it's like super important. They gonna, yeah. People going to look at your Instagram, check your IG to see if they like you or if they want to. Okay, now nah, his Instagram popping. Let me yeah. let me be cool with him. So you know, it's definitely like a business card or like a billboard or something. You know. Well, it, and it's crazy, dude. And I'm starting to question some other some of these people on their Instagrams too. It's like, dude, <laughs> how the fuck you got seventy thousand followers? Who who who's following you? Like, you don't you don't post shit, and I never heard of you. Like, who is this guy? But whatever, I I, I ain't gonna throw stones, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, man. So you know, you're you're an author as well, man, and mm -hmm. um. You know, you have your your latest book, the two thousand percent raise. So, right. you know, I just want to ask you, what was the vision and the idea behind that? While you were, um, you know, creating and writing this book? Yeah, man. So, two thousand percent raise is telling the lesson of of why corporate America needs to be looked at a little bit closer if you're coming up in it. You're being raised in corporate America. Have the same epiphany that I had. Is this really in your best interest? We're kind of programmed through societal societal conditioning to think that, hey, you know, let's get this job and hopefully I'll get that promotion to manager one day and then I'll be regional manager and then I'll be, you know, director of distribution and blah, blah, blah. One day I'll be vice president, like my boss's 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 boss. And, you know, that's awesome. Nothing's wrong with that, but you got to like, Dude, if you're good at your job, man, put yourself on top of the damn org chart. You're doing this for somebody else. Understand that. So I use myself as an example. I had a great freaking job, man. I was 27 years old. I was killing it, dude. I was an up and comer at this freaking billion dollar insurance giant. I had an office. I had an assistant. 
I was making like about 140 grand a year. And then this is back in 03. It's a lot of money, man. A lot of money now. Dude, I could have stayed there. And right now, I guarantee you, I would not be on your podcast. I'd be working the same job there. And I'd be golfing a lot. And I'd be going out for beers and having vendors kiss my ass. But I'd be making 250 grand. Okay. And I'd have a big title. And I'd, you know, my chest would be puffed out. And I'd be driving some freaking Ranger over that I could barely afford. Okay. If I didn't make the decision to quit that job, I never would have given myself a 2000% raise over the next 10 years. I sold the company built equity for 10 years in my company that I sold that all went to me instead of someone else that I'm never going to see a piece of that, you know, and, and, and the book really examines all of that. And it's, and it's told in a funny way. It's, it's my voice. It's all written by me. I, you know, I had an editor kind of help me out with grammar, but there was no ghostwriter or anything else, man. So it's um i think it's pretty impactful it's coming out um in november actually but anyone could get on the uh you know on our distribution list at 2000percentraise.com um the podcast gets into things from the book but we also focus on you know on high profile guests as well but the, but the book itself is really you know, really a guide bro I, you know we talked about kiyosaki earlier um i, I would never I would never suggest my book would be where Dale Carnegie's is. I have so much respect for that book. That's just different level shit. How to win friends and influence people is different level shit. And there's a lot of research done and other shit. But Robert Kiyosaki's book has a huge impact. Rich dad, poor dad. And it was about his personal life experiences and showing the world what he learned in these experiences and then hopefully us as the reader get to apply it to ourselves okay i would say this book from that standpoint is uh very very similar and and what are some things or what are some messages that you want the people and the readers to pull from that book and the, and the kind of carry with them throughout their own lives yeah one of the things is you know the emphasis the the emphasis that um Things that that happen while you're employed somewhere else, you, you, you're almost brainwashed into thinking that they're relevant, okay? You know, hoping that you get that job title to uh, a promotion, you know what I mean? You, you, people are more worried about being the damn regional manager than they, and getting the 6% raise that comes with it than, like, what's really happening here, like... Like the corporate America has brainwashed us all to feel like, you know, this is the way the world works and, and, and you're in an environment that you're surrounded by people that are brainwashed just like you at that job. So I got news for you. Oh shit. The regional vice president's coming into town one day. Everybody be on your P's and Q's dressing your suit. Oh God, I got an email comes out late Friday afternoon. He's coming in Monday. Dude, do you think outside of the walls of your organization, anyone gives a shit that Scott Wilson, your regional VP, is coming in? Does anyone, does he do anything? In that environment that you work in, he's God. But outside those doors, he's not, man. You and your, your colleagues are brainwashed. And, and as soon as things start to click that you really understand this shit, you start to look at it and say, okay, because this is not just this is not a negative book to make you hate your freaking job. That's not my point. But I want you to have the epiphany that all this shit happening around you, bro. Is this really anything that matters? Well, wait a minute. This guy's full of shit. That's full of shit. Why do I care about this? Actually, I respect him, but he's part of the same environment I'm in. He, he doesn't see it. I can see it now. I can see what he don't see. You know what? I can do this job by myself. No, man. No, 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 no. You're, you're by yourself. We have 20,000 employees. You'll never be able to get those clients. Why not? What's happening? I, th that client that you got, how, are 20,000 employees, are your 20,000 coworkers working on them? No. 19,999 of them aren't doing shit. You're doing 95% of the damn work. And maybe, you know, somebody that's aggregating customer service does the other 5%, whatever. You know, every industry is different, but, but, but once you start looking at shit through, through this, this lens, 
you see the world differently. And what I want to I want to encourage readers to do is once they see it, then formulate what works for you. I've, I've described what kind of worked for me in it. Okay, I go out on my own. I could do this from my kitchen table. That might be the answer for you. The answer might look a little bit different, but you got to understand truly what's going on and peel back that onion and, um, in order to get there. How do you define success as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and as a, you know, venture capitalist? Yeah, man, as an entrepreneur for me, you know, unfortunately it was always money driven for me. You know what I mean? I'm sure there's people that could give a better answer for that. That's more politically correct or, or whatever. But there's nothing glamorous about insurance. There's nothing fun about insurance. That's where I built all my, you know, my wealth from. You know what is fun? Making money. That that was fun. You know what I mean? And 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 trying to beat my last month. Oh shit! And in 2013, I had a, you know, a $350,000 month. Okay. 2014, let's make one of these months 351,000. You know what I mean? Like to me, that 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 was fun. You know what I mean? um um you know selling out to private equity i think is uh anybody would agree that that's that's usually a, a good benchmark for success if that, if that happens for you especially in today's environment with private equity paying big multiples um but uh you know i i i for my for me for the venture capitalism the score the verdict's still out you know what i mean i i, I will be successful in venture capital once my companies start having exits and if more of my companies get bought by the amazons of the world or or by you know or by private equity or by other some other strategic buyer if more of the early stage companies i invest in get bought then go out of business to me that that's a, that's a huge success um, because the stage I'm getting involved in these companies, bro, some of these companies are like ideas that are just written on a PowerPoint because there's no company yet. I'm funding someone's idea. So um, if you get 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 at least half of them to work, I think that would be a good benchmark for success for me. What drives you and what motivates you to keep you going? You know, most people will, you know, receive a, a mm. large sum of money and, and go and hide in or go live in a, on an island or whatever in isolation. Yeah. What what what's your drive today? Yeah, it's it's funny, man. So so here's the way I look at the world. I um I work backwards on on five percent. Okay. So so what I, whatever money I have in investable assets, multiply it by five percent. Divide it by 12 and whatever that number is, that's what I could live off each month. Now I take long-term capital gains uh, taxes uh, off of that. And is there enough money there to, to live on? And what that would mean then is that my nest egg each year, okay, stays the same. And I'm just living off that 5% that that, that money's making me. Well, what about years, John, that you, you know the market's down 8%? That's okay. Because over time, you know, hopefully, you know, I'm good enough with my wealth manager to, you know, be in more than that 8% plus range. Um, I'm only peeling that 5% off. So, so that, that will counter those down years that we're not near 8% because I have the cushion of that 3% of the years that we are. Um, and, it'll, and it'll also, I think, take care of an inflation for me. So, so that's kind of how I look at, look at the world. Um, I had initially um my goal in my 30s was to be able to have 10 million dollars by the time i'm 40 and I, I blew through that by a lot so you know you know if, if you take that 10 million dollar rule five percent is half a million dollars take capital gains taxes off of it and you know you, you do the math could, could you live on half a million dollars um what, what i noticed was that i can't anymore and and you know, hopefully you and your, some of your listeners that, that find success will hopefully have the same problem, but it's like, well, wait a minute. Like I would have thought I'm a big fucking asshole if like I can't live off 30 grand a month, but you know, once you accumulate things, things just get more expensive and you do shit, but, but I could afford it, but I could afford it. So it's fine. Um, anyway, to, to answer your question, taking everything I just said into consideration, I've worked backward on 
what my monthly nut is that I spend that I'm very comfortable and that there's a lot of a lot of cushion in there for me that I'll be comfortable. Okay. How much lower is that from what I have right now? And I will play with that money in venture capital. If, now, if I were to lose all of that money, this better not happen. But if I were to lose all that money and get down to that level, I'm, I'm making sure I never get below that damn level. I'm saying last, okay? So I'm kind of playing right now, but there is a significant amount of money that I'm playing with, and and I I do um, plan on being successful with it. However, if I have a big freaking goose egg across the board, I'll still be okay. I, I just, I'm going to, I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going to stop investing in people if that happens, but I'll be okay personally. No, that's incredible, man. And I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's a important piece of knowledge and piece of information is to, you know, help, help the listeners and help people understand that the mm -hmm. rich and the wealthy have people on their team that help them maintain what they have. They hire the wealth managers. They hire mm -hmm. the the um, accredited financial advisors. So, you know, I mean, was that something that was important to you early on is just making sure you had those right people on the team to help you uh, have this longevity? Yeah, you know, and, and it's it's a it's a challenge. You know what I mean? There, there's big companies out there. Like, for instance, UBS has a lot of my money. Mer I have some money with Merrill Lynch. Used to have some with JP Morgan. Um, there's a company called Bernstein. That's good. You, you know, once you get high net worth, th those guys are going to be all over you. OK, and, and they're going to want to bring their best resources to the table to serve you. They, they focus on getting people that have assets to be, to become clients of theirs. When you're a little bit further downstream um, from a financial standpoint, in terms of how much you have to actually invest, you know, you, you got money managers like say Charles Schwab or all good companies or people might have Ameritrade accounts where they're just doing it themselves or another big one is um, Northwestern Mutual, you know, do the math and, and look into the person actually advising you. Okay. Ask your, if Northwestern Mutual is calling you and like, say you got 40 grand to invest, you know what I mean? Like the attention that you're going to get from the person, you just got to like kind of pay attention to or, or have real expectations. Okay. So if, 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 you know, find out what he's making off of your investable assets. And if it's like one or 2%, work backwards. You know what I mean? Like, okay, Northwestern Mutual is taking, I'm just making this up. I have no idea what they make, but let's say it's 2%. And let's see, say your financial advisor there gets a 50% commission on that 2%. So whatever 2% of 40 grand is, what is it? 40,000 times 0.02, is that right? 40,000, yeah, it is right. Okay. Yeah. It's freaking $800. So, and if he's getting half of that, okay, dude. So in that example, you know what I mean? This guy's making $400 a year off of you. Okay. Like he's going to have to, you know, look at him. What kind of car is he driving? Oh yeah, dude, he has an infinity. Okay. Well, this guy probably makes 80 or 90 grand a year. You represent <laughs> $400 of that. You have real realistic expectations on what you're really going to be able to lean on this person for. Okay. And, and as your money goes up, you know, that, that dynamic changes. So I say all that, bro, because, you know, I, I think the, the companies I talked about earlier that are going after the high net worth people, you could do that same math and the numbers look a little bit different. Okay. This mother effer is making 70 grand off me. He better take my damn freaking phone call. He better do this. He better jump through this hoop. You know what I mean? Um, he better call his VP of research to find out, you know, why Snapchat stock just dropped to $11 and if they expect it to go back up or if I should sell it, you know what I mean? You're not going to get that from somebody that's making $400 on your damn account. You're going to get it from, you know what I mean? So I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not really making a recommendation either way there, Wes, but, but I think it's important for your audience to understand everything I just said and make their own decisions. What does the future of Glenn Crest Global look like to you? 
Um, if I could get a couple big exits, man, a couple of these unicorns, bro. If, if I have a couple of these deals, like hit home runs, because I have a couple that are billion dollar ideas. I'm involved in a couple that are potentially billion dollar companies that also might be zero dollar companies. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if they go billion dollar company, I'm saying in total billion, I'm not going to make a billion dollars off of it, but I would make a substantial amount if a couple of these do it. What the founders very well think that they're going to do. If, if that happens, um, John Sarasani's capital uh, is, is going to just keep going up substantially. I already, I already am living the lifestyle I want to. My, my monthly nest egg ain't going to change. If I make more money, I'm probably not going to buy anything new or anything. maybe another home. I, probably not, actually. Uh, it's probably going to stay around where it's at today, man. It's probably going to go down over time because my kids are going to get older. Um, so what, what I would do with, with that capital is probably start getting into some bigger deals in, um, in later funding rounds. And, um, and, uh, you know, if that's the direction it goes for Glencrest Global, um, beef up our staff from a diligence perspective in terms of just analyzing, um, um, current deals because because right now we're just not staffed to to do later stage stuff to look and see, to actually look at the books, figure out okay you know can we compete with these private equity firms when we get involved in later deals we're only doing it because we're relying on another private equity firm or another VC firm that's staffed to analyze these deals and then we're following them in that round say they might put a couple of million in and we come in for maybe a half million um that will do because we know they've done the diligence but if we were going to be the leader of that round that would mean we need to do our own diligence and it just won't make any sense to, to hire staff to do that and write check sizes that big um until i have a a couple of these big exits behind me and, and then that would be the future of Glencrest global but i'll tell you what man by the time that happens bro who knows maybe we'll want to do something else with our lives we'll, we'll see man man that's incredible john mm. thank you so much for your time tonight man i enjoyed getting a chance to speak with you and getting a chance to pick your brain and uh yeah. you know you definitely dropped some gems tonight man awesome man thank you and congrats on your podcast this is uh this is awesome thank you man